Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sophia. Uh, I work with the events team here at the School of Education. Um, I just want to say it's been a pleasure serving you all these last couple of days. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our excellent sponsors, um, one of whom has generously donated uh, a couple of vouchers, uh, that being budget car hire. Uh, so we've done something a little bit fun. And if you would all sort of swivel your desk, chair desks up, and if someone could try and feel underneath, you might have an envelope, might have one, an envelope voucher. <laughs> one winner there, excellent. And another winner there, awesome. Um, but thankfully we're all winners today because um, Budget has actually offered all our conference delegates a, um, a discount offer um, and that's all that's all information that you can find on this flyer that was in your delegate bag. Um, the Blue Mountains and the Southern Highlands is excellent this time of year. Um, also, there is two gala tickets uh, still available uh, for tonight's gala, and if you were interested um, and were upset that you had missed the boat, you haven't, um, come and see myself or Jack Bell, uh, Ali Clark, Debbie Sundy, um, and then all of our committee staff, and they're happy to kind of send, send you um, our way, and we can make that happen for you. Thank you. Good afternoon. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Badigal peoples of the Eora Nation, and pay our respect to the elder past and present, and welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people who are with us today, and welcome everyone to this session. It's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker of this afternoon session, Dr. Jane Pieto from the University of Ashland. Jane Pieto has helped thousands of teachers and administrators to gain their bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees and endorsements. She's a published and award-winning poet and novelist, as well as a distinguished scholar from the National Association for Gifted Children, a Torrance Creativity Award recipient, and a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Mensa Education and Research Association. Among her books are three editions of Talent Children and Adults, Their Development and Education, two editions of Understand Those Who Create, My Team and Brain, Understand the Creativity Writers, understand the creativity and creative for the 21st century skills. Um, her keynote is entitled Organic Creativity in the Classroom, Teaching to, to Intuition and Academic in the Arts, which is the title of her latest book. Well, let's welcome Dr. Jane Pieto with a round of applause. Thank you. I only have one outfit. <laughs> Those of you who took my, my workshop, um, I had a different necklace on. Uh, I have some lovely outfits with me, but I'm so cold. I have layers and layers on, and I'm from the north. So I don't know what you people from the south are doing. So I have an exercise for us that I was talking to other people and they had to leave these sessions because they're so cold. 
So if I see you starting to leave, this is what's going to happen, and we're all going to dance. Just take those old records home. Listen to the bands. Listen to So we'll do that sometime during this talk, all right? And warm up a little bit here in... Sydney. I thank the committee for asking me. I'm so honored. I, don't, I was so surprised to get the letter, and I'm just hoping that I can meet the expectations that they put upon me by inviting me to be one of your keynotes. The abstract is here. You don't have to read it. Because <laughs> that's what I'm going to talk about. So this will be the test, the post-test. But I did give a pre-conference session the other day, and we were talking, and our knowledge of each other's geography is quite parse. So I thought I'd give you a little geography lesson about where I'm from in the United States of America. I have just retired from uh, Ashland University, and I am now living in my childhood home in the upper peninsula of Michigan, hugging trees walking my dog by Lake Superior and on inland lakes and just enjoying that beautiful place. This is where it is. These are the Great Lakes of the United States. That top lake there is where I am. I'm on the southern border there of Lake Superior. And my university was down there below that bottom lake, below Lake Erie. It still is, Ashland University. <laughs> Here's where I'm living with the blinking light right there, and the other blinking is where my university is. So that's Geography 101 now. If you go on Jeopardy, you'll know where the Great Lakes are. The next test, boys and girls, will be can you name them? <laughs> no, you cannot see from one side to the other, and yes, they are fresh water. Why am I up here talking about a book that I edited? I got a letter from Joel McIntosh, who uh, owns Proofrock Press a few years ago. And he was wondering whether I might like to edit a book that would speak to creativity that emphasizes the intuitive, that perspective that captures the spiritual, the unconscious thought, though when I use that term, I do not mean supernatural, as a source of creative energy and production. And I sat around and thought for a while because I have been talking about this and writing about this, and I was honored that he would think of me. So I started to put together a list of subject matter experts, not psychologists like many of us are, or I'm not a psychologist, I'm an educational administrator, but people who are really have a deep knowledge of their subject matter. And I put together about 23 people and asked them. They had true expertise. They had practiced their teaching and work for over 10,000 hours. And they have over 500 years of teaching experience. So I contacted these people, and they were enthusiastic in their response. And they thought, the time has come for an emphasis on the intuitive as well as the cognitive. So I put together this book called Organic Creativity. What is organic creativity? It's just like organic food, right? Unforced, spontaneous, free, pure, living, animate, etc. So organic means it arises naturally. It doesn't really even have to be are taught, usually it comes up through the expertise of experience of being a teacher. So here are some of my books. Uh, unlike Kiersey yesterday, I wrote the books and then I started publishing the articles <laughs> out of the books. People would ask me, and it's all right at my university because we're just a small university, and I, it's not a research one, and I didn't have to go for big grants and everything like many of you did. So here's uh, an example of Creativity Studies book in which I have an article. And uh, this is edited by two of the giants in the field, uh, Ron Baghetto and James Kaufman. I stand on the shoulders of giants. Many of you are in this room, and I am honored to be among you. 
I put the, together the Pyrto Pyramid of Talent Development in the first edition of this uh, talent, this uh, synoptic textbook in 1994. We're not going to talk about it here. <laughs> But I just, I'm the one who invented it, so you, we'll talk if you want to talk with me later. The context of creativity for this talk is that most people think that being creative means being in the arts, and they say, I am not creative. That's a misconception. If you're bored today, um, just take a look at the program here and count the number of arts that are mentioned in this program, and you will find a couple of A's within the word STEAM. That's all. I did it. <laughs> I told her I had a slide like this, and then I took it out, and she said, you should do it, because uh, those of us who are in the arts sometimes feel a little left out in the field of gifted education. So the working definition of creativity that I came up with back in 92 when I wrote this book was very simple. Creativity is a basic human need to make new. Now we have a lot of definitions within the field and a lot of them have a social responsibility thing to them like Hitler wasn't creative because he was bad. And I just disagree with that. So it's just a basic human need to make new. Period. All people are creative. Creativity is present in everyone, in every field, in every job, in every life. And as my undergraduates would say, even worms are creative. This is the best creativity book around, Rollo May's book, The Courage to Create. I keep revisiting it over and over again. And he was a genius. He was a Jungian from the Midwest. So I started publishing articles like this because I felt left out as an artist. I'm a published poet and novelist, and I was that before I got into the field of gifted ed. And I would take creativity training workshops from very famous people, and I did many things. I brainstormed, and I scampered, and I did this, and I did the CPS, and I taught people how to do it because I was a coordinator. And then I'd go home at night, wait for my kids to go to bed and my husband to go to bed and then I'd write poems all by myself in the dark or with one light smoking cigarettes and drinking wine. <laughs> I didn't scamper. I didn't use CPS. I didn't brainstorm. So there was a disconnect in my life as a professional in gifted education and as an artist practicing my art. So I started to look at things and in a different way. And these are some of the recent articles that I've published. Uh, as you see, I still keep the poet, poetic practice going. I'm involved in the Poetic Inquiry Group of uh, AERA and in the Arts Based Research Group of AERA. I'm on the board of the National Association for Gifted Children, Gifted Child Quarterly. And at our board meeting at, in November, I said, what if I submitted a poetic inquiry? And my esteemed colleagues did not know what it was. They said they would find out, though, if I did. So <laughs> I haven't done it yet because there's enough publishing that's going on. All of the articles that I mention and that many of these people have mentioned can be accessed through ResearchGate. We are, many of us are members, or BE Press, which is the library press, or through Google Scholar. So um, the internet is really, really wonderful, and you can get access to a lot of people's work that way. Well, creativity is the natural propensity of human beingness. Creativity can be enhanced, but also stifled. <clears throat> The creative personality can be developed and also thwarted. What is unnatural and sad is for creativity to be repressed, suppressed, and stymied through the process of growing up and being educated. These are illustrations by my, uh, my graduate students. I allow them to make images instead of write essays. These are my AP high school teachers. This is an AP physics three and four teacher. This is a statistics, advanced statistics seniors. So my research method is qualitative biographical. I don't do surveys. I'm a reader. I'm an old English major, so I read 
and read and read. And I would read uh, biographies for themes, biographies of creators, scholarly biographies, puff biographies, autobiographies, memoirs, interviews, etc. And then I would code them. For example, here's a, something about Anne Sexton, who I'm working on right now for an article for uh, Dorothy Sisk's anthology. Hell, I'm disciplined, disciplined too in everything but my work. And the discipline, the reworking, the forging into being is the stuff of poetry. The original impulse is only that, and perhaps only poets get that as a gift. So that's a good quote on this need for self-discipline in, in your field of creativity. I came up with five core attitudes. I'm just this is a really, really fast. Seven eyes. Inspiration, insight, imagination, imagery, incubation, improvisation, intuition. And I'm probably going to add an eighth eye called intention, that I don't have to talk about the thorn and motivation separately. And then general practices. These are what creative people do during the process. There's a need for solitude. They use ritual to get into a state of unconsciousness, of oceanic consciousness, which is a term from Brewster Gieselin that I like a little better than the term flow. Lots of exercise. You read these memoirs, they're walking around pacing, walking around in the morning, at night, etc. Often meditation, not in formal meditation in a Buddhist sense, but a sense of mindfulness, a sense of observation of the world. A quest for silence among some. Some like to walk, write or do their work in coffee shops, but often silence is important. And that they pledge to themselves to live a creative life. They would call themselves creative. And then I put divergent production here because I'm in the gifted conference. So. I used to do training for, for Guilford, for Mary Meeker, and I've trained a lot in the divergent production. And there's a literature in all of these things that I just mentioned. But I think there's a need for the voices of real teachers. How many of you are teachers? Do you hear your voices in the literature? How many of you are experienced teachers with 10, 15 years? How many of you think you know what you're doing? <laughs> it's always a learning, isn't it? It's always learning. Every semester is different, and you learn more. We are gifted with the fact that we have these wonderful stu students who teach us, no matter what level. And so I decided to use the personal essay in this book. Which is the teacher in this picture? No, no. The one in the red pants. She's the, uh, the uh, quiz bowl, and she's a physics teacher, and she has five children. That's Nikki. <laughs> I was doing an observation for her endorsement. We have in our classes a lot of people who have studied in great depth other fields, and we don't let them perform in those fields in our classes. They're not allowed to write music in an education class. They're not allowed to do a painting in an education class. They're not allowed to do a poem or write a story in an education class. So I've tried to change that in my practice. I, teach a, I taught a course in, called uh, Teachers in Film. And this is one of my students who is a, our teacher. And he made the archetypal teacher in film, male, a little troubled, some, some drug problems, attractive, but with dead eyes. <laughs> Think of the films you know of that are teacher films. And it's a film called Teacher, it's a poster, <laughs> and it's going to start August 28th, he said. So I, I encourage my students to make images rather than write essays. They've wrote and written a lot of essays, a lot of essays. So this is a poem from a high school advanced placement history teacher. Flow is a mindset. Flow is movement. Flow is when the groove is real and the magic happens. Flow is when the ideas sit, percolate, marinate, and incubate. Flow is when you don't even need to think. Flow is necessary. It creates. 
It bubbles up inside, drawing inspiration from inside, sometimes outside. It demands to be heard, demands to be channeled. Flow is when you can't be interrupted. Give me just a minute to finish this slide. And then Michael says, I may not create art or music or poetry, but I create learning, plans, lessons, laughter, memories. And for that, I need flow. Sometimes it isn't there. Sometimes the muse is busy. When that happens, I need to refocus. Flow comes from accepting the unknown. No, flow comes from embracing the unknown. Flow comes from trust. Trust in yourself. Flow comes from trust of creating the light world doesn't care. Make yourself happy. Let it flow. And uh, for his individual creativity project, he did a, a, a monologue. He's such a brilliant speaker, the kids just hang on his words. Hang on his words. And the course that I observed, he was talking about the massacres in Cambodia to 10th graders. Paul Pot. The kid. So that's Michael. Our creative self is our essential self. And our job as teachers is to find our own essential selves, but it's also to help our students connect with their essential selves. So I include meditation field trips and everything. It was really cold in Ohio this March. I'm the one that looks like the uh, Michelin uh, tire person. <laughs> uh, We take the whole day, we walk in the woods for a while, then we go to a graveyard and meditate on, on uh, the dark side. And then we go to the local art museum and meditate on beauty and art. We have lunch together and have a salon. And uh, it's all done alone. Nobody talks to each other. We just share at the end. It's nice. So creativity occurs in domains, as I say, in the pyramid. Here are some domains. We forget that all these domains are learned from teachers. So our Kappa Delta Pi chapter at our university made t-shirts like this one year. Isn't this great saying? Teaching is the profession that creates all others. We had a lot of t-shirts for sale, but they're all gone now. What do teachers do during the creative process called teaching? What are the practices of creative teachers who are real domain experts? The method was personal 6,000 word essays by experienced teachers in domains taught in schools. The only domain I didn't have was physical education and I regret it. How does one become an expert? These people you would call experts just by our common definition from Erickson et al. So here are the stars of my talk. That was the intro. This is George Johnson. He's been teaching in a pullout program for 30 years in rural Appalachia. Kids who have cars on blocks and eat road kills. I have found that the easiest and most consistent way to encourage creativity in the classroom is to ask the question, why? In a relaxed setting, allow students to close their eyes and use their mind's eye to see. There must be time to incubate, to allow the images to come forward. Try reading selections from appropriate literature with highly descriptive scenes. And this is how, what's amazing about George. I have taught music history in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, taught Beowulf and Egyptian history in the British Museum, taught structural integrity at the Eiffel Tower, taught art history at the Louvre, taught about fresco painting at the Sistine Chapel, the development of medieval armor at the Cleveland Museum of Art. I've taught about Goya at the Prado, about volcanism in the ruins of Pompeii, and about pterodactyls at the top of Mount Pilatus in Switzerland. Each year, for 30 years, I have taken rural Appalachian elementary children as young as second grade to New York City, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Mammoth Cave, Gettysburg, Williamsburg, and Washington, D.C., and high school students to Europe. And he did a survey one year, and half of his children had never been to McDonald's, which is only 20 miles away. This is Jessica. She's a choreographer and a dancer in New York City, and she teaches at Hunter College. 
I try to help them notice what intrigues them and trust themselves to play and follow where their own creativity leads. It's a process of looking and listening more than teaching, or at least more than teaching in the manner of instructing. And in this essay, Debbie talks, Claire, are you here? You use this book, don't you? Is she here? No, okay. Um, you missed out. You could have been recognized as being one of the doctor. Learning to be in a cairn is her topic, and she really talks about observing her students and getting to know them and holding herself back from instructing until they discover what they want to make. To make space, I need to get out of the way. Dan Peppercorn has six C's for engaging students in social studies. He has a book that's available on Amazon on teaching uh, social studies creatively. New lessons that link unrelated topics, hands-on assignments. His students are so in love with him that uh, he can barely miss school when he's sick. Erin Daniel, she's a physics uh, a calculus teacher. With all of these mandates being pushed on from the top, it is more important than ever to be able to infuse students with the freedom to be creative and to exhibit what is lying somewhere in between. This can come in the form of allowing intrinsic motivation to lead the lessons or to find the sources of inspiration for the students. Math teachers should present the different ways to solve problems, allow students to choose their best method, and then learn how to get to the solution in the way that best suits the individual. She's so powerful, they've taken her into administration, which I'm sorry about because her students <laughs> were uh, lucky to have her. This is Sally Stevenson. You've seen her at NAGC. She does a lot of uh, songwriting workshops. Music from the radio, an MP player, an, our other external source vibrates the ear, but the vibration coming from a participatory music experience resonates through the whole body and beyond. Sally's in China right now teaching music to Chinese students. Intuition plays a big role in learning to relax into this conversation of listening and answering musically. There is never an insurmountable problem that will prevent someone from engaging in a personal experience from music. And some of the, one of the questions I ask my students is to, uh, why, why do you like your music? Because it's so personal. It's so personal that we get into really good, good discussions about that. Maria is a guidance counselor in inner city Cleveland. In an instant, I felt a chilly stream rise up my spine. I only felt a jolt of impending danger hit me and my mind uttered, uh-oh. I felt my heart race. Something was very wrong. I could not shake that uh-oh feeling. And she says, incubation, even when this happens, is, is there, but it's a seconds long before she has to act. I cannot think of any story in my counseling life where intuition did not play a significant role. This is uh, my friend Christopher Reynolds. He and I have read, written, I think, the only three articles on deaf psychology in the field. They were in Roper. He's a retired... Uh, French teacher, world languages, and he's the one who instituted the feeding back that I do have in my books. Instead of saying, hey, dude, that's cool, putting a smiley face, putting a frowny face, grading it, respond to the work by saying, this reminds me of, or I thought of Goya when I saw your work, or this work resembles, or I see, and at the highest level as a teacher, if a student gives you work that is so powerful, you give them your own work back, your own artistic work. Write them a poem, make them a, a, a painting, and say, I, I, you moved me so much I can't respond, so this is for you. Anybody from the workshop Thursday? Do you have your artwork given to you? The, the, you still have anybody hold it up? 
They have art, if you, if you can find it. Everybody has a nice artwork of self-portrait. There's one self-portrait by somebody else, contour drawings. Signed art, signed art came out of that workshop. <laughs> Christopher is a singer-songwriter and a shaman. He has uh, been accepted into the uh, tribe and, uh, of the Sioux, and he does the sun dance every year. This is physics. This is Rod. It's easy to walk into a classroom and tell the teachers what you know, but it takes a lot of creative courage to walk into a classroom and to let the class be led by the students and to follow them as the professor. It requires a confidence in your understanding of the material and a certain willingness to grasp the material deeper than you may have in the past, and he's a master of this. I can't let go of that much control, but his students absolutely love him. This is Kristen, she was his student. I'm a, I encourage my students by designing and building devices, et cetera, and uh, physics is a great place to do that. Not by, not by a plan, but by making it themselves to solve the problem. This is Tariq. He's an artist in the schools in New York City, and he sees a lot. He sees a lot. He sees schools that have no paper, no pencil, no teachers. Keith Tabor is at Cambridge in uh, London. He's a science, famous science educator. And he says, beyond building models, models and knowing enough science to be able to teach the concepts, teachers of science should utilize a creative tactic in developing metaphors, similes, and analogies between the target knowledge and what is already familiar to learners. What did uh, Einstein, how, what was the metaphor he used? You would, the, the beam of light. We should be more impressed by a student who can devise a role play, develop a graphical representation, construct a narrative, or build a model. This is Jeremy. He's in that movie on, with uh, Don Cheadle. He's the lawyer in this movie, but he's uh, at the Cincinnati Shakespeare Theater. And he has taught for me for many, many years in the Summer Honors Institute. And he says Shakespeare, teaching and working with Shakespeare is the way that he thinks is the best way to develop vulnerability. He uses a lot of games. By feeling silly or foolish in front of one another, pivotal and circumventing that formidable obstacle of learning the ego. How many of you play games in your classes? It's true, isn't it? This is Diane Montgomery. Many of you know her. She's my sister, and uh, she's uh, your graduate student. She did her doctorate with you. Graduate students often are relieved that their implicit theories are valuable to their practice in education or psychology when they receive the academic permission to trust intuition, insight, and imagination in practice. She has her own holistic educational model. I invite you to try to find it, or find it. I'd say it's out there. Don't. This is my friend Stephanie Tolan. She's a Newbery Award-winning uh, uh, child novelist, and she and I were poets together in the National, with the National Endowment for the Arts in the 70s. Young mothers traveling the state, giving poetry workshops and classes. She says, schools are to creativity as zoos are to wildness. Just as the very nature of zoos curbs much of the wildness of its inhabitants, the nature of schools curbs creativity. This is Barry Oreck. He's got an arts assessment process. He's also a dancer, dancer and the partner of Jessica. And he talks about that certain something, and he's trying to find how we can assess that certain something, and we can't do it. You know what I'm talking about? When you know somebody has it, the it factor, you can't define it, you can't measure it, you can't even describe it. It's something that is so intuitive. And that's what intuition is. It's 
without words. The charismatic performer communicates with a level of focus, a connectedness to an emotional source, a sense of calm amidst great effort that made specific people stand out to experts and untrained audience members alike. The most accurate definition, he calls it A, italic capital A, would be access that these people have access to one's inner voice, to the intuitive subconscious connected self. A is also integration in the sense of connecting the physical, emotional, cognitive aspects of our being. And if you're on Facebook with Barry, he's playing a lot of music in Brooklyn right now and little dives. Besides, he and Jessica just had a dance performance in Manhattan. This is Charles Kaldemeyer, an arts educator. The students experience should, uh, should challenge students to venture out of their comfort zones without totally alienating them. Temporary alienation is okay. I had to walk a line between empathy for her inner turmoil and insistence on progress toward meaning. The teacher of the gifted has to know that carrot and stick the smiley faces have to come, but they can't come easily. And those teachers that I know who can do this, those children are following them, just following them. We had a theater guy, Robert, come to our Summer Honors Institute, and he did, uh, they did a musical theater, three groups. One group, the, grad, the person was Barbara Ames, the other was a teacher of... Um, music in, in uh, New Mexico, and they praised those children so much that the kids didn't work. But Robert had those kids pacing the halls, because they, they'd do a song and he'd say, oh, almost, you're, you're almost there. And they were, they were wanting him to say, please, it's wonderful, and they, he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't, oh, ugh. their play within a one week was fantastic. <laughs> and they came back to him forever. Celeste Snober, she's my friend. She's a dance educator at uh, Laney's University and Simon Fraser University, and she talks about the body with her teacher education students. The body is the canvas for creativity. We paint with our hands, dance with our feet, sing with our breath, and sculpt with our palms. Our very beings are creative. We are made with the glorious impossible, ears that hear, flesh that remembers, pulse which regulates, and hair which protects. She has a new book out from Sense Publishers. Cindy Burnett joined the Creative Problem Solving Institute at Buffalo a few years ago. Cindy is an actress and a dancer. She uh, did much, much, much theater throughout the country, and then she went and got her PhD at Buffalo, and she has brought intuition into the creative problem solving process. It is just wonderful how that process has changed because of Cindy. This is Todd and Layla, his wife, who are literature teachers. Todd is also at North Texas. We teach literature creatively in hopes that our students will catch even a momentary glimpse of the sublime. If you're a literature teacher, you're there because you saw the sublime in the literature you were reading, and you wanted kids to experience that as well. A breath with truth so pure that it takes one's breath away. The glimpse of the sublime frames meaning deep within our intellect. The sublime is pursued with reason, found in imagination, and verified by intuition. Brannis uh, was, uh, did the world with uh, Harry Belafonte, and she's now teaching in uh, Oakland. She said, we teacher artists are freer thinkers than classroom teachers. <laughs> and she said, I literally saw children turn around and become changed, transformed. It's a matter of spirit. 
This is Carl Lego, a very famous curriculum theorist, language ed educator from uh, Canada. We often get in the way of word weaving in the schools. We try to reduce language to basics, essentials, rules, conventions. And this is the person who replaced me at Ashland University. They put her, me on the search committee, and I was very wily. <laughs> and uh, she's now joined our field as an assistant professor at Ashland University. This is from um, her, her doctorate was from Akron in teacher burnout. She's a singer-songwriter as well. And I don't know if this is going to work. I said there wasn't a video in here, didn't I? But there is, okay. <laughs> well, that's Jennifer singing to, uh, we had a, a morning song at our, at, our, at our institute, and the kids would be singing our morning song at eight o'clock in the morning, you can see from that. Then from teachers that I've had since this book was written, advanced placement teachers, the curriculum prescribed by the College Board is a lockstep program that does not feed the souls of gifted students. Are you listening, educators of the gifted? Sure, they can master the seven characteristics of a DBQ, but that is no more fulfilling than the mastery of any set of technical skills. I have incorporated creativity into my AP classes. This is Dr. Scott King Owen at Bexley High School. and. The projects that his, he gave permission, he was given permission to give permission to his students to do creative projects for AP classes, and they are just amazing. This is Sally Deem, a third grade teacher. She says, power of choice. The students chose, choose the novel, and then they discuss it, and the work completed with the study was beautiful. This is Julie Horger, AP English. I create assignments that ask my gifted students to juggle multiple abstract con concepts. Bexley High School is often rated one of the top high schools in Ohio. And uh, 35 of their teachers took the full endorsement paid for by the district, and they just finished up this last year. What, what? Oh, sorry. I was trying to play you the music. <laughs> OK, so here's the summary, and I think it's right on time. Takeaways from the personal essays. Teachers should resist the current climate of multiple choice assessment, single target can't standards. Any applause? <laughs> Teachers should know their students' strengths and teach to their strengths. The teacher should teach improvisationally. That is, the lesson can be changed when the situation changes. The teacher should feel free to stray from the lesson plan and use his or her intuition to determine the direction of the classroom situation and the lesson. The teacher should seek to develop a climate of feedback in the classroom where the students trust each other. And this is very, very difficult. It has to be, it has to be um, cultivated. And we, the workshop I gave the other day, we talked about means of how you can get group trust in various groups. Students should be encouraged to learn from failure and from vulnerability. The teacher should use creative humor, which teaches and engages students. Administrators, counselors, and teachers should not be afraid to trust the gut. Techniques such as meditating, slowing down, paying attention, and mindfulness should be part of a teacher's repertoire. The use of field trips increase the likelihood of students' engagement, remembering, and transfer. And I know you can't get a field trip going because there's no money in the district and you can't get things. So take a field trip into the playground. Take a field trip to the basement of the school. Take a field trip to the attic and create lessons from that. The getting out of the classroom and being together is what's 
seems to be important. You're learning, and I know that you are because men, when I, when you, I asked you if you had mastered teaching, very few of you put your hands up. We never master it, do we? We never master it. Every class is an adventure, and it's mutual. You, you drive home, I, I drive home just, what did I learn today? What did I learn today? And, oh, I was so mean to her. Why was I so mean to her? And I, this was one night I called out a woman, and oh, I still feel so guilty about it. I've bent over backwards, but I don't think she's forgiven me yet. Self-knowledge tools such as mandalas, walking the labyrinth, reflections, nature walks, and the like help give students insight and inspiration. Uh, Lori, did you go to Diane's house and, and uh, do meditation at the lake house, Lori Croft? Oh, because I, that sounded so great. She would in, she'd invite her graduate students. She had a lake house in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they'd spend a weekend meditating. All right. Now, whoever is planning the program for the next World Council... Circle this. How many of you have ever been in a play? How many of you have ever been in a choir? How many of you have ever played on a team? How many of you have sung uh, solos? Look, look at this group. How many of you make artwork and just do it for fun? How many of you take trips with your family to the national parks? Isn't that part of your essential self and your memories? So let's change the program a little bit in Gifted Ed. I'm getting out of it now so I can say that. <laughs> Don't just invite Jane to do the art, because that's not fair. Talent is omnipresent, but there is a certain something beyond talent that is indefinable that experts and audiences know when they see it. And as I said, that's the unfair part. That extreme talent is the unfair part. Know thyself is a goal for teaching and living creatively. And as a professor and as a teacher, I, the course they most dread is the creativity course. And then it's the course they most appreciate at the end. Because it's a know thyself kind of a course. And not just focus on the right answer. All right, I promised you I'm a poet, so I'm going to bore you with a poem. A few days ago, I crossed the international date line on the way between LAX and Sydney. I was watching the movie Hidden Figures about African-American women mathematicians who helped NASA get John Glenn into space. I felt spaced myself, reimagining what they imagined through their knowledge of sines, cosines, arcs, and angles, all while zooming at 336,000 feet above the deep blue sea in a darkened, droning cave. Here in Sydney, in the Southern Hemisphere, the winter solstice took place on 21 June at 1423-25. The ancient or or originals knew this and designed tributes. Stonehenges exist throughout the world. Sunrise today was at 6.56 a.m. Sunset is 5.10. The days and nights are rushing to the equality of September. The normal curve never closes at the ends of its imagined parabola. Somebody can mathematically slip out. <laughs> these mysteries, these products of creative human minds making sense of skies and seasons and the statistics of difference make us act as if there are no miracles. There are. In a few days, Tuesday, Thursday, I will leave here. I will trust that I will cross the date line and arrive in L.A. three hours before I left Sydney. <laughs> I will wait for five hours and fly to Detroit and arrive and wait for five hours while Sydney is entering Wednesday 
Odin's day. I will fly for one and one half hours to northern Michigan, and by then, in the same 24 hours, I will have one half hour left of the same Tuesday on which I left, <laughs> hidden figures calculating where I traveled 14,956 kilometers and regress 16 hours to live the day I lost on Monday, crossing the international date line. The miracle of human creative imagination fortified by brains, expertise, background, and desire is what we celebrate here at this conference. Let us be reminded of the poetry inherent in our very existence. Let us pause for awe. Right, one more activity before we head off and start thinking about the dinner tonight. One of the enjoyable things about being on the World Council is that I'm chair of the Scholarships and Awards Committee. So it's time to honour some of the experts who have contributed enormously to the field over the last three or four decades. I'm going to begin. So, Professor Julia Roberts and Dr Denise Flyth and I uh, have been on the um, awards committee for this year. And may I say, Jane, I come from Melbourne, so I made sure I brought my overcoat with me. So, oh, I'm actually warm. Okay, the first award that we're going to give tonight is the International Award for Research. The recipient has been active in gifted education since he completed his Master of Arts in Education in 1965. And while he taught secondary mathematics in Montreal, Quebec, Canada from 1967 to 1969, he continued his interest in cognitive processes underlying high ability in his PhD. His supervisor, for some of us who are a bit older, was Professor Philip Vernon, who had originated the hierarchical model of intelligence, from G branching down in a pyramid to levels of more specific abilities. This recipient continued his focus on giftedness, adding social foci such as friendship patterns, while combining these with two other strands of closely related research. The first additional strand was on teaching and learning in higher education, and the second was on, was on inquiry-based learning and teaching. Bright students tend to populate higher education and inquiry-based approaches. Collaborative learning models and related approaches are among their preferred learning experiences. His productivity and participation continued during many years as a program director, nine years as department chair, and five years as dean. Believe it or not, I have shortened this. Okay. The recipient is a licensed teacher and psychologist who has spent nearly 40 years as a researcher, teacher, and graduate supervisor in educational psychology and school psychology at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec. He remains active in supervision and publication as Professor Emeritus. Of the 476 books, chapters, journal articles, conference presentations, and dissertations or graduate reports with which he has been associated, not counting over 100 workshops, plus decades of classes taught 279, or 59% of those, have been directly on giftedness or the education of the gifted. 
His research and that of his students has been recognised by the 1995 Distinguished Scholar Award from the US National Association for Gifted Children, five awards for excellence for research from Mensa International, all for articles co-authored with his students. Election as a Fellow of the American Educational Research Association based on a nomination from a researcher on giftedness with a focus on his part of his work and his being part of a list of the 53 most influential people in gifted circulated by the American Psychological Association. The recipient is a reviewer or editorial board member for virtually all the major journals in gifted education, including Gifted Education International, Gifted Child Quarterly, the Journal for the Education of the Gifted, High Ability Studies, the Journal of Advanced Academics, and the International Journal of Creativity and problem solving. He also reviews for more general journals such as learning and individual differences, teaching and teacher education, exceptionality, education, international, and the International Journal of Science and Mathematics Education. He has reviewed grant applications for major agencies, including the US Office of Education Javits Committee that initially funded the US National Research Center at the University of Connecticut and its collaborative universities. These are Professor Bruce M. Shaw's main research contributions to giftedness, gifted education, and the links between both with important issues in general education. His contribution includes particular links to the World Council, and it continues in his post-retirement activities as a researcher in the field. So I'm Pleased to announce this afternoon that the winner of the International Research Award is Prof Professor Bruce Shaw from McGill University. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he can't be here tonight because he's just moved house and his daughter's just had a daughter. However, we have a video from him. This is a very special honor for me. Thank you to the awards committee of the World Council. A special thank you to Anne Robinson and Joe Renzulli and Lani Konevsky and Franz Monks for making this nomination possible. Thank you, everybody. I do regret that I cannot be in Australia to receive this in person. I've enjoyed being at most of the World Council meetings since, in fact, the first one that happened before the World Council existed. So thank you again, it's a special honor, and have a wonderful conference. I had written out quite a few comments, and after Jane presented, I think I don't need to tell you why we're giving her the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children's International Creativity Award. Jane, please come. But you do understand why I didn't feel I needed to talk about her creativity. It's my great honor to deliver the Harold Peso Award for International Leadership and Gift Education to Dr. Eunice Soriano de Alencar from Brazil. Dr. Eunice Alencar is a psychologist and a professor emerita of the University of Brasilia in Brazil. She got her PhD in the 70s at Purdue University under supervision of Dr. John Felderhusen. Uh, she's a pioneer in the area of gift education in Brazil and in other Ibero-American countries. She's a recognized leader, researcher, and a pro prolific writer in the area of giftedness and creativity. 
She has served as president of the Brazilian Association for the Gifted and vice president of the Ibero-American Federation of the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children. She has also been the role model and mentor for many young researchers in education and psychology uh, who became engaged in the area of the gift education because of her support, encouragement, and expertise. Please, let's give Eunice a big round of applause. Well, I am extremely honored to be here in this conference receiving this award. You can't, you can't imagine how happy I am, how proud I am, how grateful I am. I, I'd like to also to share with you that it's a great coincidence that I met Dr. Harry Passel many times. Uh, probably few people from this audience knew Harry Passo. He was a great, a brilliant scholar. He was a great man. So he invited me, for example, to participate in symposium, in a symposium. He, he, he is in my heart all the time. So this is a great coincidence. I'd like to thank the executive committee for this honor. Thank you very much. That concludes the award ceremony. For those of you going to the dinner tonight, it is in the Tyree Room, which is in the Scientia Building. Um, and if you don't know where that is, consult your map. <laughs> <It's> that way. <laughs> Thank you. G19 on your map. Thank you, Susan. <laughs>